Well, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of James, chapter 3. The book of James, chapter 3. The theme of the book of James is spiritual maturity. It's, it's practical Christian living. And, and this book addresses those practical matters of life for the Christian. How we deal with trials. How we deal with temptations. How we treat one another. Having a faith that works and is not dead. How we use our tongue. It also deals with wisdom, pride, worldliness, judgment, boasting, and even prayer. The key verse is James chapter 1, verse 4, the second half. It says that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's a summary, not only of, of the purpose of trials, but of the book of James. It was written to help us grow up in our faith. It is written to help us mature as Christians. Now this morning, in chapter 3, James will address how we use our tongue. So I suppose the, the, the uh, title of this message might be Taming the Tongue. We're going to see this morning that our tongue can be used to direct, much like the bit in a horse's mouth or the rudder on a ship. It can also be used to destroy, like a fire or like a poisonous snake. And lastly, it can be used to delight, like a spring of water or a fig tree. Now, while James will begin this message speaking to teachers, those with the gifting and responsibility of teaching the Word of God, this chapter equally applies to each and every one of us. Because each and every one of us, unless by accident or defect, have a tongue. And we can use that tongue for good or or for evil. We can use it to build one another up, or we can use it to tear one another down. The tongue is a small member of the body, but it's one of the most powerful members of our body. During World War II, 125 people died for every word in Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. You see, words have the power to delight or words have the power to destroy. Throughout history, the tongue has been used to inspire armies and nations for good and for evil. And today, like never before, we are seeing the power of the tongue through various ideologies advanced by way of the internet and social media. Some of those ideologies are good, but many of those ideologies are evil and destructive. And now we have the issue of the rise of artificial intelligence adding to that body of either good or evil, depending on how it was programmed. So I want to encourage each and every one of us this morning to pay attention, to listen to what the Word of God will say to us about our use of the tongue. That in this fellowship in an, and in our lives, our tongues might be used for good. They might be used to edify and to build up one another in our faith. Amen? Amen. So if you're not already there, turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. My brethren... So you know James is speaking to the church here. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So James begins, not with the man in the pew, but with the man standing behind the pulpit. And it's a warning, because the man standing here before you can use his tongue for good, or for evil, to build up or to tear down. Those who are called and gifted to teach others the Word of God must know that God will hold them 
to a greater level of accountability. James says we shall receive a stricter judgment. And, and I know this to be a fact and to be true because I'll tell you, God doesn't let me get away with anything. I try, but He doesn't. You might get away with it, but He doesn't let me get away with it. So James commands, it's a command, let not many of you become teachers. Apparently in James' day, a lot of folks wanted to be teachers, but they lacked the spiritual maturity to teach others because their lives did not match up to their words. See what I'm saying? Their lives did not match up to their words. And that's the issue, isn't it? Those who teach, those who sit in the place of teacher or stand in the pulpit as a preacher must live the life that they tell others to live. Their lives must consistently match up to the Word of God. If not, they are unqualified to be teachers. Now this does not mean that they are perfect, as we're going to see from the next verse. But it does mean that the consistent character of their life must match the Word of God. Towards the end of this uh, chapter in verse 12, James says, Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh water. You see? It's one or the other. Now there, there will be times that a spring might run muddy, like we're seeing today with all the rain and the, the snow melt. The rivers, the streams, the creeks are running a little muddy right now. But if, if the consistent character of that stream was always mud, you need to find a new stream to drink out of. Amen? Amen? You understand what that means? It, it, we're talking about the consistency, the character of your life. In verse 2 it says, For we all... What does all mean? All. all. That's everybody. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect or mature man able also to bridle the whole body. So, while none of us is perfect, amen? Yes. None of us is perfect. A perfect man or a perfect woman, while none of us is perfect, we should be growing, you see, toward perfection. That is, toward spiritual maturity. We should be growing up in Christ and growing out of our worldliness and into Christ likeness. Amen? Amen? And nowhere is our spiritual maturity seen more than in what we say and how we say it. Amen? What we say and how we say it. And you know, the easiest way to keep our tongue under control is not to just not say anything. The easiest way to keep our tongue under control is that we are under the control of the Spirit of God in our lives. And the only way to be under the control of the Spirit of God is that we draw near to God and spend time with God in His Word and in prayer. You know, it used to be down at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when Pastor Chuck was still alive, that he had an assistant pastor by the name of Romaine. And when someone would, and, and Romaine, by the way, was a retired sergeant major in the Marine Corps. So he didn't mess with Romaine. But when someone would come to Pastor Romaine's office with a problem, he would ask them two questions. Number one, he would ask them, are you reading your Bible every day? Usually the answer was a head hung low and a, and a no. And then he would ask them the second question, are you praying every day? And once again, he would usually get the same response. Well, no. So then Pastor Romaine would tell them, well, go back, read your Bible and pray every day for two weeks. And if you still have the problem, come back and see me. 
you know, we, we look at that and think that sounds a little harsh. But you see, he understood clearly the connection between our spiritual maturity and our relationship to the Word of God and prayer. There's a direct connection there, you see. And we would all do well to understand that relationship. We cannot grow up, we cannot mature as Christians by only showing up here on Sunday morning, right? And not being uh, in the Word of God regularly, in prayer regularly. It doesn't work that way. We must be men and women who read God's Word and pray regularly. Next, James explains to us how our words can be used to direct, you see. Because our words can direct, they can destroy, and they can delight. Look at verse 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. So in this first example, James uses the horse. And, and some of you have horses, or you've been around horses, and this will be crystal clear to you. For others, you're going to need a little explanation. Now, a typical American quarter horse weighs about 1,500 pounds, and yet we put bits in their mouths, and they, they obey us. And, and we don't weigh 1,500 pounds. Years ago, we had a, a family at our church down in Reno who had horses, and they had two little girls. And those little, those little girls are now grown up and, and married and have families of their own. But back in the day, they were, they were little girls. And they were tiny and they were skinny. And yet they could sit on those horses, gently holding the reins, and move those 1,500-pound horses wherever they wanted. I've seen them do tricks on those horses. I've seen them back those horses up through a, a series of log zigzags laid out on the ground. And they could make that horse go one direction or the other, even backing up or forward. All by simply holding the reins and gently steering the horse with the bit in its mouth. You see, the tongue is like that. It needs a bit in the mouth. Amen? Amen. <laughs> it needs some control. And that's where the idea of giving it over to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be holding the reins. Amen? Let the Holy Spirit hold the reins of your tongue. Hopefully he's not pulling back yelling, Whoa! But there may be some times when he does. Amen? Times when the Holy Spirit does need to rein us in. But what we say, you see, what we say in this example with the horse, what we say can have an effect on things much bigger than ourselves. That's James' point. And he continues that point in the next verse using a ship. Look with me at verse 4. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Imagine those old, great sailing ships. They had several huge masts, and they had these huge sails unfurled, being driven along by fierce winds. That would have been quite a sight to see. A sight we no longer see since the advent of steam and diesel and even nuclear-powered vessels. But in James' day, it was a common sight along the Mediterranean Sea. And yet it wasn't the sails that directed the ship's course. It was a very small rudder in the back under the control of the pilot. And that pilot, that helmsman, could steer that gigantic ship 
whichever way he wanted using that small rudder. That's the tongue. It's a small little piece of a bigger ship we call our body. And yet it can steer us safely along or it can steer us into the rocks and disaster. It all depends on how we use it. Some of you fellows can relate, I'm sure. I'll bet when you were younger, you said some things with your mouth that your body then had to back up. You see, the tongue can direct us in a good way or it can direct us in a bad way. It all depends on how we use it. Next, we see that the tongue has the power to destroy. Look with me at verses 5 and 6. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Wow, yeah. (laughs) So James compares the tongue to a little fire. And this is something those of us who live here can all relate to. Over the last several years, little fires have erupted into raging infernos, burning through our county, even burning down our homes, and in some cases, causing the loss of life. And it all started with a little fire. You see, the tongue, like a little fire, can cause great destruction. Many a reputation built over many years has been ruined by a lie told by the tongue. This is why James says the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. Used in the wrong way, the the tongue, what we say, and sometimes even how we say it, can be a destructive force. James says that the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles our whole body and sets on fire the the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. In other words, when the tongue is not under the control of the Spirit of God, it is then under the control of the devil. And that can be destructive. Next, we see the tongue can also be compared to a, a poisonous animal. Look with me at verses 7 and 8. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's amazing to me that James could claim in his day that every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea has been tamed. I guess long before SeaWorld came into being, mankind had tamed creatures of the sea. We all know about lions and tigers and bears and elephants. Even some surviving species of dinosaurs have been tamed by mankind. Oh, you, you didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that in the records of ancient China, there was a position called the Master of the Dragons. And there are carvings and depictions of chariots being driven, the Chinese equivalent of chariots and wagons, being driven along by what looks suspiciously like dinosaurs. Isn't that interesting? Every kind of beast, of bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Well, the point is that man has tamed every kind of animal. But some animals can be dangerous and our tongue can be dangerous like a dangerous animal, like an animal that is untamed, you see. In fact, It's an unruly evil, he says, 
full of deadly poison. Then he gives us an example in the next verse of that deadly poison. Look with me at verses 9 and 10. With it, that is with the tongue, we bless our God and Father. And with it, that's with the tongue, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Do you hear that? These things ought not to be so. So in this example, we see that the mature Christian cannot live an inconsistent life by way of what he or she says. The spiritually mature Christian lives a consistent life with their tongue. I've seen far far too many professing Christians praising God, raising their hands on Sunday morning. But the rest of the week, they were holy terrors. You see, their lives were not consistent with the faith they professed. Out of their mouth, they blessed our God and Father on Sunday morning. And then out of the same mouth, they cursed men the rest of the week. James says, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Our tongues, what we say and how we say it, ought to be consistent with our faith, consistent with what we believe. Our tongues ought to bring delight to others, not destruction. Our tongues ought to speak sweet things, not cursings. Amen? Now look at verses 11 and 12. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Does it? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Can it? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. What we say and how we say it ought to bring refreshment and delight like fresh water, like a spring. In fact, if we claim to be mature Christians, then what we say and how we say it ought to always be consistent, irregardless of whether we are at church, at home, on the job, at school, at the sewing club, or on the football field. We ought to always be consistent. Amen? Amen. Now, from time to time, as I mentioned earlier, the spring will run muddy. Like we're seeing today around our county with all of the, the spring runoff. But if that spring is always muddy, always dirty, always bitter, don't claim to be a clean spring on Sunday. Amen? Don't be inconsistent. Don't be a liar. Repent of your sins and clean up your spring. Amen? Amen. And sometimes you've got to go back to the source to clean up the spring. Mm-hmm. Right? The dirt is buried way up high. You've got to go get the dirt, dig it out, get your spring clean. Do some spring cleaning, see? <laughs> That's how that works. Now, in another example from agriculture, James asked the question, can a fig tree... My brethren bear olives or a grapevine bear figs. And the answer, of course, is no. Like you've heard me say so many times from the pulpit, if you claim to be a Christian, there ought to be some fruit. There ought to be some evidence of your Christianity. And that evidence ought to be consistent with what you claim. If you claim to be a fig tree, then you ought to bear some figs. Amen? If you claim to be a Christian, then there ought to be some fruit hanging off of your life that shows and displays that you are a Christian, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that you, and that's what Christian means, by the way, Christ-like. We ought to look a little bit like Christ, amen? There ought to be some of Christ in you showing forth if you claim to be a Christian. But if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a fig tree, but you're always bearing olives... 
Well, then the truth is you're really an olive tree and not a, not a fig tree at all, you see. What you say, how you live, truly speaks volumes about who you are. Either a Christian or not. Either a fig tree or an olive tree. It's impossible for followers of Christ to speak like the followers of the devil consistently. You get what I'm saying? And again, that doesn't mean we never slip up. In fact, somebody noted that it's because the tongue is in a wet place in your mouth is why it always slips up. (laughs) It's prone to slip. And that's why I think God put teeth in front of it to act as bars, you see? But if the consistent character of your life is to always slip up, to always speak like the children of the devil, then perhaps you are the children of the devil and not the children of Christ. And I know that those are some hard, hard words to hear, but but James doesn't pull any punches here. He doesn't hold back from the truth. And we need, we need to hear and practice the truth. Amen? Amen. We need to not only hear the truth, but we need to practice the truth, to live the truth. So our words, what we say and how we say it, can bring delight or destruction. We can encourage one another, or we can discourage one another. We can build one another up, or we can tear one another down. Under the control of the Spirit of God, our words can be a delight. But under the control of the devil, they can bring destruction. So choose choose to be a delight to others by what you say and how you say it. Our words can be used for good, like a fire. Fire is good when used properly. It can warm us in the winter. Or our words can burn down the entire church, you see. Our words, when tamed like an animal, can be useful to us. Just think of all the the good work oxen, teams of oxen, have done throughout the centuries and continue to do in, in some cultures today. On the other hand, our words can be like a poisonous snake. And as a result, it can even cause death of the body of Christ. Lastly, our words, when fitly spoken, can provide right direction, like a bit does for the horse or a rudder does for the ship. But that ship without a rudder is destined to end up on the rocks and a horse without a bit is just a wild animal. So put your horse under the control of the Holy Spirit. Put your ship under the control of Jesus. I, my grandparents, who I think came to faith late in their life, but my grandparents on my mother's side had a photo, picture kind of thing, sitting on the table in their living room. And it was a picture of a sailor at a sea at the helm. And he's standing at the helm behind him. Uh, the waves and the wind, the rain is, is, is going, but also behind him is Jesus standing with his hand on his shoulder. You see? Allow Jesus to steer the rudder of your ship. Put yourself under the control of the Lord. We're going to conclude this chapter here today and we'll begin, uh, we'll finish this chapter next week along with chapter uh, 4. But I have no doubt that what we've covered thus far in chapter 3 regarding the tongue has given us a lot to think about. Cause us to think about what we say and how we say it. The mature Christian will bridle his or her tongue under the control 
of the Spirit of God for the good of others. Amen? For the good of others. The immature Christian will just let fly whatever comes to their mind. A lady once came up to Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist from Chicago. And she said to Mr. Moody, she said she thought her gift was to speak her mind. <laughs> Mr. Moody told her he didn't think Jesus would mind if she didn't. <laughs> so let Jesus hold the reins of your tongue. Let Jesus steer the ship of your tongue. Be a delight, be a refreshment, be an encouragement to others by what you say and how you say it. Amen? Amen, amen. amen, amen. What a great book James is. Amen? What a practical book. I mean, it doesn't get any more practical than this. Amen? How we speak to one another. So I want to encourage you. Don't miss. Don't miss out as we continue through the book of James. And if you do miss, pick it up on YouTube. Pick it up on our website. Or we even have CDs in the sound booth for those of you who are old-fashioned. But don't miss out. God has a lot for us to learn and grow in through the book of James. Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up for one final song. Once again, Lord, we so, so thank you for your word, for your truth. And, and, and we pray, God, that you, by your spirit, will help us to live out the truths that we've heard this morning regarding our tongue. Take the reins. Take the reins, Lord. Take the helm, Lord. Take the, the steering wheel of our life. Put us under your control, Lord. Lead us, guide us, direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen. amen, amen. Don't forget, next Sunday, communion, followed by a potluck. Bring a dish to share or simply bring your appetite. Amen? God bless.